uh, last four lectures we have uh, talked about the changes in the industry and how it has evolved over a time and how the concept of supply chain management has started to come in so that's what the uh, talk was there till now now we come to the directly come to the point where we talk about supply chain now i did tell you about it that uh, the, the there are players in supply chain we call them as entities so these supply chain entities are your supplier manufacturer transportation distributor retailer consumer all these are your entities in supply chain now uh, there could be many suppliers there could be even two tier suppliers who are before the supplier manufacturer transportation units distributor and it's not like every time there is going to be a, a retailer it is also not possible that all the time there is going to be a distributor but this is the most generic model which you see right now okay so we go ahead and uh, at times supply chain management has been referred with different terms in different different time periods so during world war it was called as physical distribution management after world war when computers were being used for uh, uh, for planning inventories and uh, the computers started to be used in your regular business that time it became materials management then uh, further it became logistics management so the, these are all uh, many terms over which the supply chain management term has evolved and then now it has become supply chain management actually supply chain management is overarching so supply chain management uh, yeah. supply chain management is overarching means it is a bigger umbrella umbrella over all the others so let's understand uh, yeah so if you look at this diagram over here at times you may think that uh, why uh, logistics is different than supply chain management so it clearly gives a demarcation and the distinction between logistics and supply chain management actually logistics is a subset of supply chain management and uh, the main activities which are there in logistics are procurement and manuf uh, manufacturing not per se that manufacturing activities which are uh, except then production means real production where the product is on the machine besides that whatever is there that comes under logistics distribution of the material in whatever form is there in supply chain is the, done with the function of logistics other would be waste disposal so these are not uh, definitive terms it is also possible that Uh, logistics may have several other activities but these are most uh, generic activities which you see now besides this what is left besides this there is a uh, managing of relationships as we talked about uh, in the previous classes that what kind of relationship supplier relationships consumer relationships we talk about when you start giving attention to that that is a part of your supply chain management then integration through information technology uh, alliances which are formed so we we have seen uh, many alliances being formed like flipkart and walmart and uh, uh, yeah. that is the i mean one which you probably would be very much aware about then vendor evaluation purchasing strategies outsourcing b2b and b2c transactions so b2b means if you are two businesses are dealing with each other that is b2b transaction b2c is when you go to a store and purchase something so that is business to consumer transaction okay then uh, uh, 
this is some indicative diagram i won't go into that this is just for your reference how supply chain management has evolved over a period of time now this is a very uh, <clears throat> interesting thing which you see over here uh, in today's market let's say your complete complete cost structure is represented by this square diagram that you see over here i mean the rectangular uh, bifurcations which are there in this so we can see this complete structure the outer boundary is representing the total cost okay now in that total this is just a represented these are just representative figures so if your total cost is represented by the outer boundary of this rectangle we can say that your total cost is composed of manufacturing processing cost marketing cost logistics cost and the profit now let's talk about the situation in today's world uh, our technology if you look at uh, manufacturing technology it is almost at its peak It means until unless we get any major breakthroughs the manufacturing technology uh, is already at its peak and it it is the best that it can be right now okay so the question is can we uh, since we are already at its best and we have achieved uh, it in the minimum cost possible so uh, we our manufacturing technology or the manufacturing companies around the world are at a place where it is not further possible to reduce the manufacturing cost because we are almost there i mean we and the lessons have been learned and people know the best practices and uh, the machines have become standard even if you go to small and medium scale enterprises they are using state of art machines because they are affordable now and no new technology as such is coming which is doing any major breakthroughs in manufacturing except on the material side you can do that but then again that is uh, that takes decades to come to the uh, real scale now tell me in the chat box uh, is it possible to reduce the marketing cost tell me in the chat box yes and no in terms of is it possible how many of you think that it is possible to reduce the marketing cost write in the chat box i'm waiting for your answer Anushka says yes. For everyone is saying yes. Okay, so I was actually expecting this answer that it is possible to reduce the marketing cost. Especially, in, uh, I'll give you example of India. We have a very diverse population, and if you have to reach this population, you you may have to use different medium. So, what all advertising mediums or marketing mediums are there? what you know of the very first thing that comes is your digital marketing okay your uh, digital medium is one way then uh, the another way is through billboards on and the third type could be your television or uh, yeah customer to customer so referrals you can say yeah then uh, your newspapers magazines flyers so these are your marketing mediums now the competition is growing it is not going down anyway if someone comes with a new type new type of product within 3 4 years there are multiple firms that will be doing the similar manufacturing of the similar product so competition is continuously increasing and the mediums with which you have to do marketing is also increasing like if you have to reach a consumer base of uh, say younger population between 15 to 30 years uh, you have to use digital medium more if you have to reach 30 to 50 then probably uh, newspapers or billboards are to be used more because they don't have time so much time to spend on digital media so uh, the, when mediums of advertising increase what happens so your yeah, advertising cost is not dependent on per unit person okay yeah, it is it is having more of a fixed cost rather than a variable cost marketing 
so do you think that marketing it is easier to cut down on the marketing cost with the kind of situation which i have just painted so now give your opinion for the people who have given opinion earlier now do you think that it is easier to cut down the marketing cost where this medium medium of marketing have increased by so much amount so karan amit uh, kora anushka you people tell at least then you had agreed earlier that yeah it is easier to i mean you can cut down the marketing cost in much better way so but since there are number since the number of ways we can market a product is increasing so there has to there like there is a big possibility that there are also mediums that involve less marketing cost like But, if we compare uh, the basic television marketing with newspaper marketing hmm. so there is a difference in the cost so similarly if we think of different ways then in that sense i said that there is a chance that marketing cost can be cut down okay you are saying that uh, alternative cheaper mediums of uh, marketing you are saying yes sir like then, there are always a better like ways uh, in which like if we talk about an event to event marketing sometimes there are events that are organized to market a specific product like in case of uh, apple or samsung launching a product and after that they have an event but so on a similar scale if they all marketed using different mediums like if they basically um, like if we take the influencer marketing uh, type then that is obviously costing them less than what uh, cost like what uh, for the entire event that they are hosting for one product no so in uh, that sense there the question is are you going to do away with the other mediums Are are you going to scrap no, the other mediums of marketing? Can you escape sir, uh, those mediums? Sir, with time, they can like the proportion can be decreased. Like now, the digital audience is increasing, so we can definitely uh, like the companies can definitely invest less on television marketing and more on the uh, number of ads that frequently appear. So that that way, it can shift, but definitely not removed completely. Yeah. So. what you are saying is absolutely fine but what i am what i was pointing out that is it easier to do that i mean uh, I, i would not say that it is impossible to cut down on the marketing cost but it is be getting difficult uh, by the day yes sir okay. yeah so because of the increasing competition because of the more and more medium available for marketing your channels of marketing are increasing so until unless you do away with some other uh, medium of marketing you will have to spend on marketing cost so uh, eventually you can see that a pressure the pressure is on the profit this small rectangle which you see over here the small rectangle which you see over here there's a lot of pressure on this small margin which you see because uh, if marketing cost is not decreasing by a larger amount and if you are going to be competitive in market you will have to inflate this to sell your product so pressure goes on profit and logistics cost now uh, logistics is one thing which has uh, been very less explored uh, especially in i can say in india of course in uh, western countries it is considered to be a very important aspect now but there was a time in 1970s when it was said to be a dark continent in business dark continent means something like africa which has been less explored okay now with the advent of it and uh, uh, the related technology the industry 4.0 technologies there has been uh, greater advances in uh, logistics management and people have been able to cut down the logistics cost by a huge amounts because of the greater computing we will see later in the co course that it requires a lot of computation there's a lot of mathematics also involved in the course so uh, it cuts down uh, the logistics cost by a greater amount so it's not only logistics we would say now uh, since this was traditional view uh, logistics is written but when the supply chain comes into picture it becomes supply chain cost so right now there is a lot of possibility there are many players in fact i would tell that uh, 
if you find out uh, from your seniors not all your seniors will be there in the core sector probably at least 20 to 25% of your seniors would be working in the supply chain area okay. uh, you just find out and uh, maybe 25 to 30% of you guys will be working in the supply chain management area when you go to the industry so uh, everyone doesn't remain engineer for life uh, eventually after uh, certain years of experience 6 to 7 to 8 years of experience you are promoted to managerial positions so there uh, all what we are learning some of you may might get a uh, job in analytics or business analytics or supply chain domain right away but uh, most of you would be looking towards this kind of these kind of jobs uh, as you go ahead in your career okay so going ahead so this is a typical supply chain what you see uh, it's a wine supply chain you can say so i won't spend time much on this so this is a typical supply chain of fmcg fast moving consumer goods so procter and gamble you can say say uh, procter and gamble are they are manufacturers or you can say they are tier 1 suppliers and their tier 2 suppliers could be plastic producer chemical manufacturer uh, packaging or paper manufacturer timber industry so tier 1 supplier is uh, procter and gamble and their tier 2 supplier could be like shampoo for shampoo there's going to be a chemical manufacturer for uh, packaging there could be another company for plastic there would be another company so uh, these will be their tier 2 suppliers then uh, procter and gamble is going to send the products to uh, spencers big bazaar reliance and all these Uh, stores, uh, or they'll be stored at third-party distribution centers, and then they go to the supermarket and customer gets it. So this is a typical supply chain. I think we have already taken up another uh, example that I took earlier was of a wine supply chain, where you see uh, grain is there in the fields and grain goes to distribution center. then from distribution center it goes to processing center where there the wine is made and then it is stored after storage it goes to uh, local stores uh, through trucking and uh, inside movement in the warehouse then it further goes to uh, local wine shops so so you may have extended supply chains not only four stages but even more extended for global supply chains so basically supply chain involves three kind of flows information product and funds so these are bidirectional flows we can say supply chain management is management of information products and funds upstream and downstream supply chain but what is the objective of uh, supply chain management that we have to find out so the overall objective of supply chain management is to uh, is to maximize the overall value created so i wouldn't say that it is to maximize profit of each stage but rather uh, there is a holistic definition which says that you should try to <clears throat> maximize the overall value created right so then how do we define supply chain value so it is the difference between what final product is worth to the customer and the effort which has been put in the supply chain now why are we not referring to the monetary figures i could have written the amount of money spent amount of money spent in making the product minus the amount of money uh, i mean amount of uh, you can say the whatever cost i mean what is the whatever is the price of the product minus the cost of making the product work i could have simply said that but it is supply chain value what is the difference between this can anyone shed some light on it why did not not word why did i not use those words like simply uh, cost and profit and uh, your regular statements why supply chain value so maybe yeah. 
sir because uh, like here if you are talking about what the final product is worth basically includes the amount like if there is a product that included some materials to be uh, like uh, is made up of something so those materials cost plus the efforts cost plus you'll have to pay all the people who are in like before reaching the final place or uh, if you're talking about a supermarket so it basically includes the uh, the cost of the entire process uh, like how it is transported how it is made then the man hours put into that so maybe because of that reason uh, it does not talk about the exact like difference between costs of like selling and uh, making so uh, is it not possible to give a number to all these things so it is possible but it depends like uh, it it depends on a lot of factors like if we consider uh, giving a product to a supermarket where we are expecting uh, the sale to be more and suppose that uh, the uh, the transportation cost there is not much so we cannot actually compare that to transporting the product to a different part of the country so that way it will change so uh, they, it cannot be like a constant value for everything yeah exactly so i'll give you one example there is a term called place value hmm. so let's say uh, a very good product has been made you are very much passionate about some uh, let's say uh, electronic product hmm. uh, good headphones are there they made very nice headphones and uh, a certain company is there which is located in south india and very nice headphones they have made and uh, for uh, the if the product is not available at your do doorstep or if the product is not available for your to be shipped and uh, to be uh, to reach to you so the value of the product for you is exactly zero so transportation what does transportation do it is not adding any raw material you are not adding any raw material to the product right what are you adding with you are investing some money in transportation what are you doing with that a product getting transported is that a value added activity or a non value added activity so non value added activity because the cost is not changing like the product is at the same rate as of now all of you give your opinion over here the product being transported from chennai let's say to jaipur or to your wherever you are residing so is that a value added activity or a non value added activity all of you uh, i see many people in the class so i expect some response from your side sir i think it's value added sir okay similarly i mean write in the chat box all of you so that i can see that you are listening and not just locked in nobody yeah okay yukta is saying value added rajkumar saying value added shubhangi rahul everyone saying value added uh shiva said non value added <clears throat> varun saying value added so i see uh, most of you are agreeing that it is a value added activity now here the catch is that you have to actually define the context in which we are saying see it, that product has got no value sitting in chennai because it can't be sold to you okay so if it has to be there in your hands and you are spending money in transporting the product from chennai to your doorstep then it is a value added activity while if let's say in plant itself uh if in it, it is a very big plant okay 
and in north side of the plant it is being manufactured and in the southern extreme the warehouse is located so the amount of time and money you are spending in transporting the product from north to north side to south side that is a non value added activity ideally it should have been the warehouse should have been located in the north side only then it would be we can say that in that case uh, whatever small amount of time and money we are spending that will be value added activity i hope i am clear over here so uh, one has to be careful in interpreting the value of the product or a value of an activity in supply chain okay so that's the whole game what i say the small amount of money which you are going to save in moving your warehouse from south side of the plant to the north side of the plant probably you may you may save some time okay and uh, the more the time you save in that amount of time the product could have been out there in the market and your supply chain could have been faster there is a very interesting case of dmart and big bazaar how many of you know dmart yeah some people have raised hands okay seven people seven people know dmart and there is a big bazaar so which of the two is uh, more profitable making more profit do you know dmart kora you are asking me or you are telling me <laughs> so i am no i am asking is it the right answer yeah it is the right answer dmart is more profit making than big bazaar does anyone know why sir uska management acha hoga ye to bahut achhi baat batayi aapne but uh, uh, any anything more specific aapne bada management aap koi bhi company ke success ke liye bol sakte hain is generic answer hai 100 mein se 100 hai ke management acha hai uska but then what is so specific about dmart which makes it because unka agar dekha jaye to 25000 crore 2500 crore i think uh, i'll have to check that there's one difference of zero over there i think 2500 crore and 20 uh, i mean 2500 and 2000 crore something like that there's a difference between their uh, revenue but then the profit making is very high in dmart as compared to that in uh, that of big bazaar maybe because of that uh, big bazaar has been taken over and dmart is uh, doing very well so what is the basic reason behind the basic reason behind that is the inventory planning or you can say supply chain planning of dmart is much better than big bazaar they on an average uh, dmart will is able to uh, sell all its inventory in 30 days means turn over its inventory in 30 days while uh, big bazaar is taking 90 days so the amount of inventory which is sitting in big bazaar is very high as compared to that in dmart so their planning has been has been uh, very uh, good the dmart gives more offers that's not the reason i'll give you one very good example of uh, offers uh after 5 minutes i'll show you one video how many of you know pepper tap kisi ne pepper tap ka naam suna hai kabhi pepper tap pepper tap it was the largest grocery online store in india in 2015 jab big bazaar nahi tha jab aapka i mean big bazaar was a very small player uh, or grofers was a very small player before that it was pepper tap uske bare mein hum bata aapko ek uh, abhi ek video dikhaunga there you will get to know uh, so so right now 
again uh, coming back to the point value is very high i mean if your value which you are creating is high then your supply chain succeeds if the non value added activities increase just like big bazaar example i have given and i'll also give the example of pepper tap later on so then your supply chain starts to fail so <clears throat> so let's talk about uh, uh, some failure stories and yeah so i will now share some failure stories and success stories in supply chain then i'm going to come back to the indian and us scenario which you were just looking at usko hum wapas se aayenge dekh so let me share some interesting video with you so we we are right now talking about the success stories of different companies so let's talk about uh, 711 have you heard about 711 india mein to nahi hai but then outside india this 711 is very popular kora knows about uh, 711 good i'm just sharing the tab just a second so this is an a bit of a longer video but we will learn many things from this of the 64 ounce double gulp and the pina colada slurpee has helped rip it is uh, audible to you Yes, sir. Okay. Revolutionize the way we shop at convenience stores. In March. Uh, you can give the attendance also. 2019, the 90-year-old brand that generations of consumers have turned to for gas, cokes, and smokes launched its first Evolution store. The redesigned venue features a growler station with craft beer, a taqueria. and scan and pay technology that allows customers to bypass the checkout line. Traditionally, 83% of products sold at convenience stores are consumed within the hour. So what is a con- uh, convenience store? What is a convenience store? Anyone? So it basically caters to the um, mostly needed uh items of all almost all categories like if uh, there is an item that people can need at any point of time which is not like a specialized item but a generic piece of goods so it contains all of that so can can you give any example which is there in india a convenience store yeah any example you can we can, we can give so like uh, the now that walmart has partnered with other uh, uh, like other com- um, other agencies basically so it can it's a convenience store uh, chain now like it contains everything it has ventured into every dimension and in india we can uh, like the nearest that comes is big bazaar only it basically has almost all categories of goods so in a way actually in uh, india we do not have uh, physically any convenience store but amazon if you look at it uh, you can pay bills in on amazon electricity bill all your utility bills could be paid on amazon you can recharge your mobile phone dth you can pay your lpg cylinder also pay for lpg cylinder right uh, so all these facilities are there on physical store okay besides that you can do you can post letters also means there's a post box also available at the convenience i'm talking about 711 at the at 711 you can have fast food also so it is like you have 10 different things to do and all those 10 different things could be done under a small under a convenience store that is a convenience store hamare india mein convenience store isliye nahi hai Can anyone tell why it is we don't see convenience store in India? Hmm. 
The answer is pretty simple, and you will all agree with me. Why do we not see existence of convenience stores in India? The answer is very logical and, uh, and obvious. Anyone? Wild guess? Okay, so uh, I can give you some hint. Uh, population say concerned. Ab bata sakta hai koi? So employment, like in uh, more number of stores that deal with specific things, the more number of employment people have, and the uh, the more basically people will be involved in earning. Okay, uh, I'll give you. I'll be more uh, specific now. सबके आपके सब सब आप सबके घर के आसपास एक मार्केट होगा राइट इन दैट मार्केट यू वुड फाइंड ऑलमोस्ट देर बी किराना स्टोर देर बी फोन स्टोर आई मीन रिलेटेड टू द कम्युनिकेशन देर बी अ फोटो कॉपी गाय आपके सब उस मार्केट में स्टेशनर भी होगा उस मार्केट में आपके आई मीन यू वुड डेफिनेटली फाइंड ऑल दिस सेवन एट स्टोर टिपिकल स्टोर लाइंड अप In a market near you, near your house. कितने लोगों के ऐसे हैं? Yes करिए. Yes sir. Two, three, four, five. Yes. So see, the whole thing is that the population of India is very dense. I mean, it is dense. Our country is a densely populated country. so these small fragmented stores together they they make up a market which acts itself like a convenience store getting it so everyone is specialized in their own thing and they are located together they are co-located so the requirement of convenience store is diminished while uh, the countries like uh, japan or Uh, USA for that matter the density distribution of the population or the density of the population is not not like India so you wouldn't find it uh, you wouldn't find it uh, economical to open a specialized shop okay india mein kya aap ek dukan kholenge stationery ki shop only stationery ki aap laga lenge to bhi you will get sufficient number of people coming to your shop getting it but if you do the same thing in uh, usa or the in fact the at in countries where the density of the population is not very high to aap se kitne log khareedne aa jayenge when they'll prefer to go to a place jahan pe unke sara kaam ho jaye right because unko distance bhi travel karna hota hai for in india uh, like hum uh, every one of us you walk within 200 meters of 300 meters you would find a shop like these a, a cluster of shops like this getting it so that's the difference between uh, indian conditions and the western or the you can say those countries where the density of the population is not very high is wajah se india mein humko convenience store nahi milta hai isi wajah se 711 apne india mein nahi dekha ab isko aage dekhte hain But 7-Eleven is betting that its new store concept and services aided by technology will help redefine the future of convenience. And with consumers stocking up on goods in a bid to avoid crowded lines at the grocery store and staying closer to home due to COVID-19 restrictions, the convenience store industry could be on the verge of a profound change. It's been an exciting year, I think, for organizations like Convenience. Shoppers see it as a, a quick fill destination where they're not. um standing in line to pick up your milk your eggs your bread your your cheese so if you go to your local shops you generally wouldn't have to wait much for much in line anyway but if you go to a convenience store aap big bazaar jate hain to more often than not or your reliance fresh jate hain aap campus ke across jo hai aapko wahan pe wait karna padta hai so because uh, again there are many things available and wahan pe counter thode hi hai these your quick fill ins 
um, and convenience has been a, in a good location to go and get those quick trips. The pandemic had a significant impact on all retail, but particularly convenience, because first off, the pandemic redefined what convenience was. Convenience stores in the U.S. make up about a third of brick and mortar retail stores and about half the population, 165 million consumers, visits a C-store each day. So what changes can 7-Eleven shoppers expect in the future? And will the world's largest convenience brand be able to maintain its momentum? Seven Eleven got its start in Dallas, Texas. In 1927, Uncle Johnny Jefferson Green, who ran the local Southland Ice Company, came up with the idea that in addition to selling frozen blocks of ice, he would offer customers staples like milk, eggs, and cigarettes. The first ever convenience store opened. In 1937, Southland expanded to include some of its other properties and named the new shops Totem Stores. A decade later, to reflect the store's extended hours, the shops were renamed 7-Eleven. In the 1950s, 7-Eleven expanded beyond Texas to Florida, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and started selling fuel. The biggest growth in the convenience store industry began in the late 50s, and that was the growth of the suburbs. That's where you started having uh, communities where the, you drove to stores, and the convenience store was that convenient place to pick up fill-in items and it was called the Mini Mart because it really acted like a small grocery store. By 1963, the chain had a thousand locations, and six years later, the brand ballooned to 3,500 stores. 7-Eleven was innovating its product offerings, too. In 1965, the brand launched the world's first coffee to go and its iconic Slurpee drink. By the 1970s, it introduced self-service gas at some locations, and in 1980, 7-Eleven launched the 32-ounce Big Gulp drink. The brand was expanding overseas too. But with increased competition and almost $5 billion in debt, in 1990, 7-Eleven's parent company filed for bankruptcy protection. Southland Corporation sold controlling interest in its retail stores to its Japanese partners, Ito Yokota, Japan's second largest supermarket chain and majority owner of 7-Eleven Japan. In 2005, 7-Eleven Incorporated was made a wholly owned subsidiary of 7-Eleven Japan. By 2013, 7-Eleven stores around the world were generating sales of $84 billion, and consumers were flocking to the retailer. In 2018, U.S. convenience stores had their 16th straight year of record in-store sales. What's escalated a lot in the last number of years is more to route towards uh, health and wellness. Um, it's becoming very important for consumers. Um, local is becoming much more prominent amongst consumers. It has is, is grown so dramatically and it has taken such hold in American life that the cool kids of retail have joined. Home Depot's open convenience stores, uh, experiment with the idea of convenience stores uh, about a decade and a half ago. Target's danced around the concept. Walmart's danced around the concept. Amazon's integrated the concept. So, so he's saying Amazon has integrated the concept. Now, do you know the genesis like the all of you know right that amazon you can do all these things you can right now open the amazon app on your phone if you can do that and uh, just have a look you go to your uh, amazon uh, uh, pay if you go to amazon pay you would find that you can do all sort of bill payments and mobile recharge DTH recharge, uh, credit card bill, broadband, landline, gas, even education fee, municipal tax you can pay. Uh, I don't think you have to go outside anywhere to do anything. You can book your tickets here. So where is this concept coming from? They're making it an online convenience store. So it's really intriguing how convenience stores, which were always the other channel, has become the cool channel that everybody's looking at. As of the end of 2020, 7-Eleven operated, franchised, or licensed over 71,000 stores in 17 countries. So you can see here 7-Eleven's uh, reach. So you can see the whole America and Canada is there, North America and Canada. You can see the Scandinavian part of the Europe. You can see China here. You can see Japan, uh, Japan, Australia, Indonesia, 
so there is a story about indonesia that also we are going to see about the fall of 711 in indonesia so there is a we have seen the success story right now so we are looking at the success story While mom and pop shops make up about two thirds of the convenience stores in the US, the industry is dominated by just a few big players. In 2020, the largest convenience store chains in the US by store count were 7 Eleven with 9,364 stores, Alimentation Kush Tar, which includes Circle K with 5,933 stores, Speedway, the retail arm of Marathon Petroleum Corporation with 3,900 stores and Casey's General Stores with 2,181 stores. Everybody has a regional favorite. On the East Coast, there's companies like Sheets and Wawa. If you go down South, there's companies like Racetrack and some others. If you go in the Midwest, there's a huge debate in Iowa about um, which convenience store is the one for you. And Iowa might be the most competitive of them all. As of December 2020, there were a little more than 150,000 convenience stores across the U.S., a 1.6% decrease from the year prior, due in part to the contraction in retail and a decline in single store operators. According to analysts, while some mom So while you see in the West, the single store operators are closing, in India it is flourishing. So the whole game is, is the density of the population, the sparseness of the population and pop stores have suffered. The overall industry trend is towards larger corporate chains. In 2018, 7-Eleven completed its $3.3 billion purchase of over a thousand stores from Sunoco. And in August 2020, the company announced it entered into an agreement to acquire 3,900 Speedway stores from Marathon Petroleum for $21 billion. So it's like the uh, bigger fish keeps getting uh, bigger and the smaller fish keeps getting killed. So. Uh, See, th this is a cycle. I mean, it, it, it's going to happen. It's going to keep on happening. It will become the most prominent player, just like it happened in online business as well. Uh, Amazon and Flipkart have killed all the other uh, web series. You know the decline of Jabong. You know uh, Mintra, fall of Mintra. I mean, they all have been uh, taken over now. Uh, there have been many other let's buy.com was there even before Flipkart was there. So all the now only two big players are left. Similar thing we see in the telecom also. In the telecom only Airtel and uh, Geo are left. So it's no not a not long before even uh, only one player will be left in the industry and that's going to be very unfortunate. So I mean but then that's how the business is going. 7 and I, the owner of 7 Eleven, said the deal would bring its store count in the US and Canada to about 14,000. According to analysts, like their supermarket rivals, C stores operate on razor thin margins. Shoppers often see higher prices at convenience stores due to higher distribution costs and fewer customers buying in bulk. Prime locations also contribute to higher real estate fees. So there was a line in this uh, fewer distributions, uh, fewer consumers buying in bulk and the margins are less on the C stores. So this is a point you should note down that uh, in uh, convenience stores, the margins are less because they're keeping small, small amount of everything. So when you're keeping small, small amount of everything, you don't have the economies of scale. So your margins become low. So this is one, uh, if you can manage this part, then your uh, convenience store will be successful. If you can't manage the small uh, margins, then your success, uh, your convenience store will flop. You're in that coveted convenient location. You're not on the outskirts of town that may have lower property taxes, but certainly may not be convenient. So there are different elements that, that go into how do you factor in prices? Uh, you better be pretty close or on point with prices because people will go somewhere else. The consumer is at the heart and center of everything that's evolving. Um, I believe that both the retailers and manufacturers recognize that. And how do you serve them, as I said, in a seamless and easy way and stay ahead of new health and wellness trends and things that are important for them as times change. In 2019, U.S. convenience stores had sales of $648 billion, down 1% from the year prior. The sale of fuel made up 61% of revenue, and the remainder came from products sold in stores. 
cigarettes and other tobacco products accounted for 34.4% of in-store sales in 2019. Prepared food, including hot coffee, accounted for 25.4%. Packaged beverages like soda and energy drinks made up 14.8%. Candy and salty snacks were 10%. Beer was 7.4%, and things like laundry detergent made up the remainder. At the start of the pandemic, 7-Eleven experienced a drop in pre-work visits with fewer people purchasing coffee and breakfast for the office. Instead, the retailer saw consumers buying items in bulk. In an email to CNBC, 7-Eleven said this increased the average cart size as people were stocking up and also purchasing things they may have typically bought at a grocery store from their local 7-Eleven. We found that people were more comfortable shopping at 7-Eleven stores than some big crowded big box store or shopping center. 7-Eleven Incorporated, which includes 12,000 stores in North America, had revenue from operations of $25 billion in fiscal year 2019, 67% more than 2015. Since the mid-2000s, the convenience store industry has seen a variety of new entrants. So we'll uh, continue watching this video. And uh, so t till now, whatever we have learned uh, regarding convenience store is that, I mean, Whatever we are learning is going into the kitty of supply chain management because all this knowledge is eventually you'll, you'll, you'll find as we progress in the course, you will find that whatever videos we are looking at, it is going to give you a big perspective. So convenience store business depends on the proximity to customer. If you are going close to the customer, the property taxes you have to pay high. So you can't have a very big store. If you can't have a big store, you can't have too much inventory. So that means you have small, small amount of everything. If you have small, small amount of everything, the margins will be low. Okay. So customers are price sensitive also in this case. So uh, as uh, the person was saying uh, before we close the video. Okay. So we'll uh, continue our talk on uh, convenience stores and the success and the failure stories. So right now the in actual, uh, Actually, we are talking about success and failure stories in supply chain management. So once we go through the success and the failure stories, whatever discussion we will have will make more sense. So that's why I skipped a few slides in between. And I'll go back to those slides uh, because that's how the continuity will be maintained. Okay, so that's it for today. And uh, we can conclude. If you have any questions, you can ask. Okay then, that's all.